then we can move on to the next two speakers, Dimitro Ivchenko and Dennis van der Stey, who are going to present TorchRec, a PyTorch domain library for recommendation systems. Hello, everyone. We all love PyTorch, right? All right, I'll take it as a yes. <laughs> All right, and that is and I, we, uh, we are PyTorch guys, and we work at Meta AI. And today, uh, we're gonna present you TorchRack. And um, TorchRack allows you to do the cutting edge uh, research because it keeps all the PyTorch goodies. So it allows, it keeps the PyTorch, Python hackability. Uh, it's uh, modular, it's composable. And in addition to that, it also allows you to take your models directly to production. All right, so uh, what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about uh, some uh, details of TorchRack. Um, I'm gonna share some benchmarks uh, over the real data and uh, real models. And um, we're gonna share some production learnings uh, from deploying uh, the large rec recommended models uh, at meta scale. All right, and uh, how do we precisely define TorchRack? So our definition of TorchRack is whatever is missing in uh, PyTorch ecosystem to train uh, state-of-the-art recommender models. And what is missing in, in PyTorch? Um, so you, of course, you know that uh, state-of-the-art recommender models, they are both deep and wide. And historically, PyTorch was pretty good uh, with the deep models, but honestly, not so great with wide models and not so great with the sparse data. So, and that's uh, where uh, TorchRack uh, comes uh, in place and helps PyTorch. So, and here I'm gonna let Dennis spill beans a little bit about the, some uh, key ideas and implementation details. Thanks, Dimitra. Um, so on the training side, what do we deliver? Well, first we uh, attempt to like fuse everything basically. So. We're embedded, we fuse embedding weights. So basically, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna fuse the different embedding tables and do, that enables bulk embedding lookups. So effectively, it's one kernel to look up multiple embedding tables. Um, and then for the backward pass, we actually fuse the optimizers to those embedding tables. So basically, instead of, instead of actually having a separate optimizer step that's done at the time of calculating the gradient on the backward pass, um, we also fuse sparse data. So what do we mean by that? We basically have some specialized data containers um, that really focus on some specialized ops. One is to permit the data, and also it's really about uh, communications collectives, particularly around nickel, um, which enable uh, typically a single all-to-all -all call to move all of your sparse data when you need to. Um, in general, PyTorch is a uh, fully synchronous um, training loop, but basically one thing we can do is pipeline the input data batches. So we also support uh, pipelining there to basically avoid doing any kind of uh, local to remote um, sparse data movement, it's outside the critical path for the forward and backward loop. Um, we also support quantized uh, embeddings, or sorry, quantized communications um, from the purpose of actually moving the embedding from the remote device back to the local device, which is typically in the critical path. We can actually quantize that through our use of codecs. Um, on the inference side, we provide a quantized embedding collection. So basically there you're talking about like going down to uh, int 8 or int 4, uh, quantization of the actual embedding weights for inference. Um, we also support high-performance uh, high GPU predictor. Um, so there's a uh, technique out there called Torch Deploy, which basically allows multiple um, Python interpreters to run within a single a C++ process, um, which enables uh, basically native PyTorch um, for inference. So we also want to share stuff. So what do we share? So we share the model sharding logic. So that's basically think about the what, like what do I actually want to shard in a distributed in training or in inference environment. Um, there's an automated sharding planner, so that's the how. How do I want to shard? And then finally, we uh, support caching layers. So, um, you know, the embeddings, the weights can either be on HBM, which is the GPU memory, or typically the system memory, which is DDR memory, and we support a caching layer there, so it can look, um, you can get some really interesting performances, and Dimitro will go into that a little bit later. Okay, awesome. Um, so how do we do it, right? Like, what do we actually do? So we do it on the NN module-based level. 
Um, it's a little different. We're not working with the graph here necessarily. We're actually going to go look for that specific NN module and swap it out. And so what are the assumptions that we make? First of all, we want to shard the biggest parts of the model. So usually we're looking for the embeddings. Those are the things that tend to have the highest value for sharding. And for everything else, we typically have this default standing of using uh, data parallel. So PyTorch supports uh, what's called DDP. They also support FSDP now too. So you can also utilize that seamlessly out of the box. So what we actually do is we just swap out those modules with a sharded version. And when we swap these out, we basically have this like, sort of contract, which is we typically have an input distribution, which is about getting the local data. Remember, we're talking about DDP here to the remote device. Then we have the compute step, which is the operators, which is typically like an embedding lookup. And then we have the output distribution. Um, so that's what we're playing to. And then I think it's really important to note, too, what makes this flex framework really flexible is that, or this library really flexible is that we enable multiple sharding techniques per module swap. So there could be like one module swap could include both table-wise and column-wise. We'll talk about those different choices in a second here. Um, so jumping to that, actually, so what kind of sharding do we do? What can we actually do out of the box? Well, um, we support data parallel replicated. That's the most straightforward case. Um, we have table-wise, which is typically known as placement. So it's just one copy of that parameter, like nothing really special done to that. We have row-wise sharding, which is typically across the hash dimension. Column-wise, which tendly falls in against the, uh, the embedding dim. We also have some more complex sharding techniques that are really important, which is hierarchical sharding. So when you're going from like a single host on like eight GPUs up to maybe 16 GPUs or even 32, as soon as you get about 32 typically, we typically see hierarchical sharding, which is basically playing the fact that we treat the host as a subgroup and then we actually set up communications. So you might do like host level table wise, host level data parallel. And those techniques actually give you, help us scale um, as you go up to GPU size. Um, so talking a little bit about the planning stage, like how does that actually work, this automated planner? So the aim is just to pick the best sharding plan, right, out of these choices that you have. So basically sharder tells you which parameters you can shard. And the first step of the planner is to basically identify using heuristics estimate the performance and the, st the storage characteristics of each parameter sharding type based on how we've implemented that shard module. Um, and so we, for the given runtime environment, which is also very important. Uh, then finally, once you've done that, you have your sort of search space. We have a limited number of proposals that we evaluate, um, which are generated, and you have to actually pick which ones you're going to do. And that's picking one sharding decision per parameter. Then we use an integer partitioner to actually decide the placement. Assuming the placements are successful, then we pick the best overall plan, and that becomes the sharding plan. All right, I'm going to hand it back off to Dimitra. All right, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Um, so Dennis talked a lot about uh, interesting and very intricate implementation details, but do they really matter for production models over real data? So let's, ch let's check it out. All right, so uh, the first set of benchmarks I'm going to cover uh, here is um, um, uh, the, you see the bars in the blue. So, um, so this is a, a, a bars in the, in the yellow. So here we um, are benchmarking uh, the deep learning recommender model. So this was, a model was open sourced by uh, 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 Facebook a while ago. Uh, and it's a very typical uh, deep and wide model. So in here, the uh, uh, bars in, in blue, it's a stock PyTorch impl implementation of embedding collections. And the bars in yellow, it's the optimized, basically fuse all implementation in TorchRack. And uh, on the left, uh, uh, you, you can see that uh, all, uh, all these optimizations in TorchRack, they, they actually matter. And they result in a pretty much order of magnitude speed up when we train uh, in a single rack uh, in a GPU memory. Now, what happens if my model doesn't fit in GPU memory? So we have the option of putting your model in CPU memory, by, and you see the result on the right. I mean, honestly, not very impressive result. Uh, luckily, uh, TorchRack allows you to also uh, have GPU memory cache, and uh, that you see the result in the middle, and that, is, that looks, honestly, much better. Now, uh, what if we're not satisfied with the training speed? So uh, what if we have eight GPUs on a single node, we have really beefy and VLink, can we leverage it? Turns out, yes, we can, of course, uh, but uh, the only caveat is that we need to select big enough uh, um, a training batch uh, so we can really uh, 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 
leverage and overcome the uh, CPU uh, launch overheads. And here uh, you see that if we select big enough uh, training batch, then we can achieve almost linear scaling on a GPUs. So now, natural question, okay, so what if we model that huge, if we cannot fit in a single host? And turns out in meta production, we run those, those kind of models. Um, and here you, uh, uh, we see two models we run in production. Let's call it blue model and, and orange model. All right, so these are very different models. And um, the orange model is more, I would say, it's very similar uh, to DLRM. It's, uh, it uses uh, built-in pooling techniques you know, available in stock uh, PyTorch. Um, it's pretty large model and it's very communication heavy. The blue model is very different. So this model is also deep, but it, it's a sequential model. So it relies on our own custom um, uh, tra transformer variation. Uh, and the, uh, the good news is that TorchTrack allows you to scale both of, of these models pretty much effortlessly uh, based on uh, uh, just using our uh, built-in auto planner. All right, so uh, now you say, oh, you talk so many fancy things, but uh, 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 are these things really used internally uh, in Meta? And the answer is yes. So all, uh, all the things we've talked about and all the code which is uh, available in GitHub, it is running as we speak internally uh, to train the, uh, what we call head models. These are the biggest, uh, the most complex, um, state-of-the-art business-critical models that matter. All right. Um, uh, so, uh, and the natural question here is that Daniel's covers so many fancy optimization techniques, but the, the natural question is like, do they all really matter? So the, it turns out they actually do. So once you start training uh, models with over three trillion parameters, that what you do internally. Uh, when we, what we see, like when we start uh, with the model, and then when we, what we end up uh, having is by applying all these optimization techniques, luckily, Torchek allows you to apply these techniques very easily, so we can get uh, over 10x, 10x performance boost in the end. And, um, all right. And now, uh, very uh, briefly, what else matters in production except for performance? I talked pretty much all about performance, but it turns out reliability is a huge factor here, and, we are, and training reliability matters a lot. Um, and another thing is that uh, distributed training over like 128 and more GPUs uh, is really notoriously hard to debug. So we spend a lot of time to improving debugging or full sync training. And the, uh, last but not least, that this, this uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, training, it st really st uh, stresses uh, the, uh, all the systems. It stresses the uh, systems for data reading. Um, it also stresses uh, the uh, uh, systems for uh, checkpointing and publishing model to, uh, to inference. So um, the good news is that all this code we have covered here is all available on GitHub. Free. And, <laughs> and you guys are welcome to take a look at the, also all the, all the benchmarks. And if you're interested, so here are the context details. And we're also going to be hanging out outside this uh, room after, after the talk. So come talk to us if you're interested to uh, collaborate. Thank you. Super. I have uh, questions. Uh, this is Wei Yanzhen from Visas. Uh, this is a very impressive work. Uh, I do have a simple question is that if, like, say, I have a very huge uh, lookup table, like the sequential documentations, I have uh, trillions of the items, and the lookup table will be very huge. Uh, do you have any suggestions to handle these problems in the touch rack? Of course. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we, uh, I showed you one of the models I showed you was a sequential, uh, sequential model, and we have uh, uh, a lot of the techniques. So, uh, one of them, so what we do is that we allow you to do uh, your transformer within a single host. Within a single host, we have a very high bandwidth in the link, and uh, one of the shardings uh, which Dennis covered is actually uh, focused towards that. So it actually dramatically imp improves the training speed in that case. We also have a bunch of other tricks, but this one is probably the, the most relevant to what you just described. Yeah, I, I do see, yeah, thank you. I do see there's a quantitative step. 
Uh, do you suggest? Uh, do you have any suggestions if we can store the the embeddings in the integers instead of the floating point? Do you think it might help? Oh, so, so, sorry, I didn't catch. Or, can you? Uh, is it possible to just store these these embeddings by integers and not floating point? Is it supported by Toast right now? Because uh, if we store in the integers, it might save a lot of memory. Right, right, right. So okay, so so. Uh, what we do, we uh, yeah, we do we do support the um, uh, re reduction of the floating uh, I think uh, uh, floating point precision. Uh, in the same time, uh, we uh, we, uh, we do uh, for the for the actual quantization, we only do this for the inference purposes. So when you, when you quantization to inference, then we can do aggressive int eight, four, and two quantizations. The last question is there any sorry, commercial uh, sorry to interrupt. Thank you very much for the nice questions, but we for the sake of Timekeeping and schedule. Please uh, continue the discussion afterwards. You, you're, you said you will be uh, out there taking questions. Okay. Thanks a lot for the great presentation. Uh, and there's a, the setting up the excitement for your framework. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.